Hello, 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 and welcome. Welcome to the Monterey Bay Aquarium live here on Twitch <laughs> and YouTube. We yay. did it. Yay. We're here. Yay. We're back. I think yay. Is it yay? Yay. yay. I think so. <laughs> yay. Yay. All right. People are tuning in. <laughs> Look at that glorious frame rate. Oh, Crisp audio. Don't jinx it. <laughs> Don't jinx it, uh, my sorry. friend. Sorry. Uh, look at us go, everybody. We have a stream. It's a normal day. Everything is is everything just is fine. Normal. Everything is fine. Good thing we did not do a stream last week at all. I don't remember doing a stream last week. Do you remember doing a stream last week, Emily? I don't know what you're talking about. Patty. I certainly don't remember any stream last week. We definitely <laughs> didn't do a stream last week, and I definitely wasn't a complete dumpster fire <laughs> <laughs> wasn't it i think it was a disaster claire is what uh it was a disaster claire yeah. oh dear i should have worn but, a shirt today yeah <laughs> hey we're here hey everybody welcome <laughs> hello welcome everyone hello friends oh so many good friends there hanging out in chat with us today hello oh it's good. It emily been... who are you oh hello uh <laughs> My name is Emily. I am a part of uh, the social media team here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, a.k.a. M that you see on the screen there with the little puffin icon, a.k.a. Monty Ray, the little dancing avatar that you see over there on the left side of the screen right now. Joined, as always, by my buddy, my pal, my terrible boy. Um, terrible. <laughs> my friend, our friend. Uh, it's Pat. Hello, Pat. Hey, everybody. It's Pat, your terrible boy. We are here for yet another Animal Crossing uh, stream. I am Rick Etz of Punnery Row here. You can see me dancing around with the hat that Emily gave me on a mystery stream that did not occur last week. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we're here to hang out with you all exploring a winter wonderland here in Animal Crossing and wrapping up. Uh, 2020, which saw um, the beginning of our gaming streams. And so we are very thankful for all of you to have stuck with us through now episode 40 over on Twitch of Hello Fellow Squids. Um, can't believe it's been 40 episodes, Emily. Uh, seems like just a quarantine ago we began and uh, here we all are. It's been <laughs> just a whole, a whole lot of fun to to wow. grow this uh, these channels with all of you. So thanks for being there. Yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, it has been an absolutely uh, delightful time getting to know all of you during these streams, during um a you know black void of time that has been quarantined so it could be episode 40 today it could be episode one who knows pat it, exactly yeah um <laughs> we've got a few folks over on youtube uh wondering where the face reveal is and if you've been following along on our channels if you do a, a deep dive enough you'll find you'll find our faces kind of everywhere <laughs> we're, we're all over the place yeah we are um but yeah <laughs> This is uh, this is so much fun. Oh, Fiore's got competing interests of uh, of streams uh, going on right now. Um, <laughs> battle of the streams. It's like battle, battle of, of the, the bands, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, cooler. Well, battle in our case, battle of the sands. You know, it's... at the beach. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, first pun button of the day. That's, that's but it's okay. Good. All streams lead to the ocean. That's the second pun, and also our our motto here on uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Twitch streams. So. It sure um, is, Pat. It sure is. Well, wave goodbye to a zero pun uh, stream. We've got it going right now. Pat, did you oh. see over there What's in that? Twitch? Uh, what? Unavailable. Uh, said this series. Unavailable. Bro. <laughs> uh, <laughs> said this series made me realize how much I like marine biology and it made me change my major from environmental science to oh, ecology. Oh, no. Yes. Oh no, Emily! Yes, people are making I have won. people are making major life decisions based off of it's this terrifying. stream. Terrifying! Oh, oh no! Oh. All right, well, uh -oh. gotta go. <laughs> um. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Nice. Congrats. <laughs> Oh, didn't like physics anyway. You know, yeah, I I only ever enjoyed physics when they were applied to the ocean. Physical oceanography was one of the coolest uh, coolest classes that I ended up taking. Um, 
Yeah, a whole lot, a whole lot of fun there. Well, that's cool. Awesome. Congratulations. Welcome to the ecological framework there. Um, what trophic level are you at? <laughs> I'm hoping on top, because otherwise, <laughs> if we don't see your, if we don't say your, oh, if we don't see your name in chat later, then oh, something happens. Yeah, we're worried. No, I think we're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, oh. oh, do a meetup on your island? Oh, one of the yeah, maybe one of these days we have to talk that over a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, Emily. Yes, you were saying something a little bit earlier that I think I cut you off for for something in, in chat. Did did we have a plan for today? I have a few ideas of things that I'd like to talk about. Um, <gasps> oh, for, thank for God, today, Pat, but... because I've got yeah. nothing. I've been oh, I've been troubleshooting. Thank God, by <laughs> thank the way. Thank God. God there. Thank Put that God, in the pun Pat. jar. Yep. Oh, um, yeah, we, <laughs> I've been troubleshooting, uh, the tech issues for the last three days. And so we got it. Can we out. get, we got it figured some out about W's 40 in minutes the chat. ago. So can we get some W's in the chat for engineer M yet again, figuring out a new way that we've broken our stream in some capacity. <laughs> we have, oh, wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. Monterey Bay Aquarium is all about education, education as it were. And we have discovered, uh, so many different ways to break uh, a gaming stream but here we are episode 40 over on uh over on twitch over on youtube a few less but uh glad to be live with all of you over there right now oh look at all the was i i uh, look at all the was. <laughs> i updated my title in the game there to, to... exhausted engineer <laughs> That's awesome. well emily um just to switch up the visual and prove yes. that we're actually playing the game, I'm just going to run over here real quick so that people oh, can yes. see. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. But uh, hello. hello. So one thing that I definitely wanted to, to talk to you about, Emily, um, as I as everybody knows here who's watching the stream, I'm looking right at you right now. Uh, everybody watching the stream, hello. Um, but Emily, as as they know, I don't usually play the game. So uh, <laughs> I'm told that you can catch snowflakes. You can, with your Pat. Net. Yeah. So, um, not I'm with your tongue, we should, but with a net. Yes. With a net. I'm thinking we should try to do that at some point. And then also, okay. I would like to discuss um, some deep sea jellies uh, or some, some gelatinous life that's been washing up here on the shore, maybe by a trip to the museum. And I'd also like to discuss ribbon fishes at some point. <gasps> that's right. Um, oh. Because there are cool things that are happening. Whoa. Uh, Whoa. Sorry, I just... I just got a big notification on my computer. I was not expecting. Oh no. Um, uh, but um, yeah, because uh, I remember way back in the day, one of our first big animals that we caught on stream that we were so, so, so excited about was our oar fish. Um, and yeah. back in the day, I confused multiple different terms for uh, yeah. these elongated fishes, um, these sea serpent-like uh, fishes out there with uh, with a type of fish that I basically just discovered it is is a thing, um, or or basically I was conflating two different types of animals. So I'd like to go over there at some point and discuss oar fishes and ribbon fishes because that is some new knowledge there, and I yes. don't want to cheat anybody who's been there since day one out of oar fish fact. I and uh, I love it. And of course that means that we're going to go visit either our oar fish, our good friend either. That's true. <laughs> yeah um oh hey uh <laughs> bibrel and hiking toro those are questions that uh um we cannot currently answer because of the the game that we are playing here with nintendo we can't uh raise funds for the aquarium uh on the stream so i appreciate all those questions you can head over to our website to find out more uh more stuff about the aquarium going on really so those answers are out there but we just are not going to discuss them at the moment Yes. Um, any siphonophores? Yes. Okay. So maybe, um, Emily, should we get started? Maybe talking about some cool stuff on the beach that's yeah. happening? Let's do it. Let's run to the beach. Do, 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 do. We made it. Okay. Oof, it was a long distance to get here. Absolutely. So um, currently, washing up on the beach, and this is very exciting, Emily. I don't know how many times this has happened over the last few years, but currently washing up on Monterey beaches, we have an entire community of midwater animal, we like to call it the pelagic magic. Which you were doing, you were doing a great job there, uh, Emily. Yes. Uh, throwing the magic there into the here. Let, let's see it again. Let's see that pelagic oh, magic. Oh, oh, hold on. Here we'll, oh. we'll do a super zoom of the pelagic. Super magic. zoom. Let's super see that zoom, pelagic, pelagic magic. Pelagic magic. Coming right up. Uh, oh wait, wait, wait for it. 
Oh, oh, Joy-Con Drift, how fun you are. <laughs> uh, and there we go. All right, let's talk see about it, that pelagic it, magic. Pelagic magic. So currently, everybody, um, for those of you folks who may be in, along the California coast, we have had an entire community of gelatinous animal, Jelly Palooza, as I like to call it, uh, coming here on to the beaches. This is a community of animal that is usually out there in the open ocean, in the midwater, not on the coast. So right now it looks like there's a mass stranding event that it looks like something um, ha has occurred, but this is completely normal. It's just these animals are out there on the currents and they happen to get caught up along the shoreside currents that push them onto the beach where we can end up seeing them. So currently, Emily, on the beach, people are finding a whole bunch of sea pickles. Sea pickles are also known as pyrosomes, um, pyrosome meaning fire body, and pyrosoma atlanticum is the specific species, and those are washing up everywhere. They're basically a colony of filter feeding organisms, um, and they produce bright blue bioluminescence when they are alive, but they look kind of like pink spiky pickles that are uh, washed up on, on the beach there. So there are a bajillion of them over in Carmel and over uh, at Asilomar State Beach. There have been some reports recently, but that we've had a few of those pyrosome blooms recently. A few things that were also washing up at the same time are spectacular Corolla uh, sea butterflies, pteropods, as they're known. So you can see terrible boy there. Um, do I still have my pter yes i do here woo i have my little pteropod so this here we established um many uh many episodes ago uh pteropods are wing-footed snails and we actually have some of those washing up on the beach right now somebody actually tagged us emily i don't know if you saw over on twitter somebody tagged us they found cleopsis croni which is basically what this animal is that you see right there in my hand uh found one in the tide pools and they were wondering what it was um but so Corolla spectabilis is washing up on the beach. They don't look at all like these. Um, Corolla would be prey of the Cleopsis that I'm currently holding on to right there. Um, but they look like spiky thimbles on, on the beach. Uh, and so those are washing up. And there's also been a lot of different types of comb jellies out there. Baroes, Leucothea, um, which we all have. Uh, we, we have those at the aquarium if you go to our... Uh, website you'll be able to learn more about those animals there different comb jellies and then siphonophores which are long stinging ropes of animal and um, washed up on the beach have been different preids and nanomia uh, siphonophores um, which by the way uh, Emily do you know what a siphonophore is this is a joke this is a joke you know what a siphonophore oh, is? Oh, Pat, I have no idea. What is it? It's a... one better than siphono three. <laughs> Uh, Sounds like a siphonophore in concept over there. <laughs> it's a whole lot of siphonophore is what it is. <laughs> um, and uh, so siphonophore is basically just imagine if you kind of took every part of a jellyfish and you uh, made copies of it and you ended up having um, uh, one part that swims, another part that digests, another part that reproduces, another part that stings and catches food in a repeating pattern. That's what a siphonophore is. The world's most famous siphonophore, of course, is the Portuguese man of war. But there are tons of siphonophores out there. They are incredibly, incredibly cool animals. And those are washing up on the beach right now. And uh, also salps. Salps uh, are an amazing video. Emily, we, we just did a really cool video with uh, SciShow about salps. Yes, we did. If you head on over to SciShow's YouTube channel, um, you can check that video out. But uh, yeah, uh, all about salps, our wonderful, our, our wonderful cousins in the ocean there. That's right. And those salps, they look a lot like um, barrels uh, with like a long strand inside that's usually a, kind of a, a cream or orange. Um, and those are their guts. And then what we also have right now are no, what's known as cyclosalps, where they are um, chains of salps that end up forming little donut circles. Those are washing up all over, uh, all over the beaches there as well. And in the in the salps, uh, there are tinier salps known as doliolids or uh, smaller ones. And those are often preyed upon by phronema amphipods, salp-killing amphipods, parasitic amphipods. And those will hollow out the inside. Actually, I'm gonna hold on to that story for. Uh, I'm gonna hold on to that story for the sock once we get that's to the museum. Good, yeah, that's a good sock story. <laughs> but Emily, I found out that ribbon fishes eat phronema 
amphipods. That's right. And yeah. I just learned that. And so now I believe that was the perfect segue to go from the shore over to the aquarium to go look at an or <laughs> to go look at an oarfish, which is similar to a ribbon fish. It's a cousin. Let's go take a look. Let's, Let's go do see it. either. Did you see that, Emily? I like I like had a whole transition. Look and at like these a segue. Look at us go. Professionals over Look at here. us go. Professionals over here. We've got a story arc. We've got narrative. We've got intrigue. We've got callbacks <laughs> incoming. I mean, look at us go. So, um, let's see. I also, I'm, I'm realizing. I think Wilderness Gay, you had a question way at the beginning of chat oh, that we did true. not answer. Oh no. Um, ask us that again if you're still wondering. <laughs> They did ask, uh, I'm sorry if I missed it. Did you answer their recent question? Are all jellies siphonophores? Oh, it's a good question. Not all jellies are siphonophores, but all siphonophores are jellies. Um, all of the animals that we just described, and that's actually, Emily, one of my favorite things. Uh, you know, when we used to do the auditorium programs, Mysteries of the Deep, yeah. that was always my favorite thing was when we would uh, when we would start discussing different animals in the deep sea and we'd be going like, Pteropods, siphonophores, salps, larvations. Those are all real words that I just said and they describe animals that we do not find on land. Um, and then I would end up convincing everybody that uh, if there are aliens on the planet, it's us. And that maybe the banded piglet squid is a better uh, representative of, uh, of life on Earth than, than we are there. That was a, a, a long joke that I enjoyed telling in the auditorium. If you remember that, <laughs> if you were there, thank you for laughing <laughs> when you were in the auditorium. Um, oh yeah, do, when, do the seasons affect the ocean? Yes, that's exactly why I was, I was remembering you asked that question because this winter time, right now we are in a La Nina year, um, a La Nina influence year, which means that, um, uh, which means that it's there's a lot of storms and everything's a little bit colder and drier than it than it uh, usually is under a um, under an El Nino year. And so in this winter time, we've had tons of storms, and those storms have been washing in that community towards the coast. So if you uh, look at Leucothea pulchra, the beautiful sea goddess comb jelly, which we don't have in Animal Crossing, but we do have at the aquarium those animals used to be known as the Christmas comb jelly because they would show up right around uh, the end of December. And so they're out there right now, um, right on right on cue. So there is this wintertime push of the wind and waves that are moving those animals on shore. And so you tend to see more of that community in this wintertime. The last time I saw this community was in February of 2016 in these same numbers. Um, and that was also a similar uh, type of year there. Um, yeah, so, um, okay, so, yes, so that gelatinous community, and then here in front of us is either our or fish. Uh, Emily, is there anything that you wanted to mention before I, I, I delve in a little bit deeper? I, Pat, I know how excited you are to talk about <gasps> okay, this, okay, okay. so just, <laughs> just go for it. Go for it, buddy. <laughs> I believe. Yes! <laughs> yes! Okay, so... We originally mentioned when we found our ore fish, we originally said that this was a king of the salmon. And then I ended up correcting myself later on the next stream saying that it was a king of the herring. Um, and because we talked about this ore fish numerous times, this giant ore fish you see right here is the source of a story of many a sea serpent around the world. And um, a friend of mine, Phil, uh, a friend of ours, uh, excuse me, Emily, Phil is a very good friend of, of <laughs> both of us. Excuse me, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, excuse me, sorry. Um, but so <laughs> a friend of ours, Phil, was working at the Catalina Island Marine Institute back in the day, also known as Simi, and he was part of the group that found this giant ore fish. You may have heard about uh, that ore fish sighting off of Catalina Island uh, back in the day. And so um, I was actually diving with Phil and we ended up finding a very small ribbon fish uh, in the water. And I immediately thought, Emily, much too, I, I was completely wrong. I thought it must be a juvenile ore fish because they look so incredibly similar. But upon exiting the water, Phil mentioned what to me fool, that actually... What a fool, Pat. What a fool. What a fool. <laughs> what a fool. It turns out, Emily, that uh, Phil uh, knows his way around sea serpents because 
he uh, told me, well, you know, actually there's many different species of oarfish and there's also what's known as ribbon fish. And ribbon fish are a little bit more commonly seen by divers. They're uh, pretty frequently seen all around the world, especially in blackwater diving, which is when you're floating out over the abyss and you have lights that attract plankton up to it and therefore the things that eat plankton. Um, but it just happened to be a night dive with that in incredible community. And so we ended up finding a um, a ribbon fish. And it turns out, I learned this, that ribbon fish um, in the family Trachypteridae, those are the ones that are actually known as the king of the salmon. So an oarfish is not a king of the salmon. An oarfish is a king of the herring, if anything. Um, but it's in a different family of fish entirely. And so... I just wanted to tell you the quick story from Milton Love's book as to why they're called King of the Salmon. So again, for those of you watching, the visual behind us is similar to a ribbon fish, but that is an oar fish. A ribbon fish is a little bit different, but a King of the Salmon. The name derives from a belief of the Maka people of the Straits of Juan de Fuca and the Salish Sea area that this species led salmon to their annual freshwater migrations. It was believed that killing this species harmed salmon harvests. And that's why they're known as the king of the salmon for the ribbon fish and oar fish um, equally regal because they're in the in the um, family Regalacidae, I believe. And uh, the um, but not the king of the salmon that we had mentioned originally. So 10 months later, Emily, <laughs> we, we, have some, we have answers. We have answers. That's my story. That's the one I wanted to say. <laughs> Hooray. Yay. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate you. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to say, because when you posted uh, the photo that you got of the little baby, um, yes. and in your description, you said king of the salmon, I was just like, excuse me, Pat. No, that's a king Whoa. of the herring. Um, mm -hmm. And then I did research into it, too. And I was just like, oh, oh, no, wait. So it is a king of the salmon. I, I I actually read uh, the full, uh, you know, Instagram caption there. So, you know, W's yep. for me for that. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. But so what that means, everybody, is for those of you who have watched our streams, um, you hopefully have taken away that we're very excited about stuff. But also, it's always important, <laughs> these facts that you learn uh, <laughs> from us, to uh, just ground truth them, too, because sometimes we might be misremembering or overly excitedly conflating a whole bunch of different things. Um, and... Uh, the king of the salmon and king of the herring fiasco of episode whenever it was uh, has now been laid to rest by um, discovering that ribbon fish are a thing so there you go everybody just wanted to say oh and uh yeah like we mentioned those ribbon fish they eat those amphipods they eat Dang. the salps which is just so cool it is there you go the ocean is a cool, so. cool place yeah. Um, you keep saying salmon. Yeah, Fiore. That's what I mean. Yeah. Is So King of the Herring is what we have on screen right now in the game. In the oarfish. King of the Salmon is the ribbon fish, Trachypteridae, which is a type of fish that I recently found um, in the bay uh, last Saturday. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very excited. That's it. Um... <laughs> Uh, for Bibarel over there on YouTube, uh, we don't have blue-footed boobies, but we did have a red-footed booby named Sula, Sula Sula, back in the day there. Yep. Um, um, and, uh, yeah. Pat, we did get a question from Henry over on YouTube about what our favorite fish in the aquarium is. And, uh, our real aquarium or this aquarium? That, that was going to be my follow-up question for them. Real aquarium mm. or this aquarium? I have a feeling that for one of us, that favorite fish is going to be right where we're standing. And for the other one of us, we're going to have to travel. Yep. Yes. Uh, sorry, did you ask me something? <laughs> <laughs> no, you? I was just waiting to see if... Uh, oh, okay. Oh, Henry says that they don't care. Um, oh, no, I think that was in response to Oh, was that before? I just didn't scroll yeah. fast enough. It's all good. Whoops. Um, I will say that uh, having this discussion around uh, blue-footed boobies and red-footed boobies and brown-footed boobies over on uh, the chat is really messing up uh, YouTube's spam filter. It's so true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's uh, yeah, that's just that's baked in right there with silly bird names. But 
Um, oh, the right, real one. The real Emily, one. The real, the one. real okay. one. Okay. Yep. Um, well, then I have well, to my change my answer. So you go first, Pat. Well, my favorite fish in this aquarium that we're currently standing at is uh, right there behind us, which is the coelacanth. That is just, stop, just I'm always shout out, love, food, love fin fish friends. Okay, whatever. Oh, was that your favorite fish? Yeah, well, my but, favorite well, fish I is the oarfish. I that's thought over that. Here uh, no, I aquarium. thought that uh, we were going to have to travel over here for your favorite fish, Pat. Well, my favorite fish in our real aquarium but I thought is you the mola. Not, not in the world? In the world, your favorite fish. Oh, in, in this... the world. It, oh, in the world, it's the mola. Okay. Why? Is that surprising? Have I said No, other I just. Things you, you shook my understanding of our friendship to my core when oh, you no, said no, no, that no. you preferred no, I was, I was... the coelacanth over the mola. No, I was just specifying <laughs> that in our Animal Crossing aquarium that one of my favorite fishes is the coelacanth because I have okay. yet to see one in real life. But that is because, like, I mean, basically the sunfish is just, it, it doesn't, you, you can't enter it into a contest for my heart because it would win every time. So it's really, it's sunfish first for everything and then there are yeah. secondary competitions for runners up to sunfish that's what i mean emily it's just i haven't changed at all that is my okay. favorite animal right there in the whole world but everybody knows that so i figured i'd just be like well at least runner up for today is that one okay okay, okay. all right no sorry i didn't mean no. to scare you no I, well, it, it, you did you scared me buddy <laughs> i'm sorry Don't i didn't mean to lead you straight i thought i knew you bad <laughs> come on uh okay I feel better now. I feel yeah, I feel more reassured of of my understanding so what, what, of the world. What's your favorite animal in, in the real aquarium, and then in the Animal Crossing? In the aquarium? real aquarium, and then in the world. Um, so in the aquarium, which I don't think that we have one right now, but uh, favorite fish, grunt sculpin. <gasps> the grunts, they're so cool. They're so cool. They're so cute. They're so They've cool. got these little teeny tiny pointy noses. And they have adapted um, that they've basically evolved to look like a barnacle and they sit inside of empty barnacle shells <laughs> and they're just like, no, I'm just a barnacle. And they just wait for something to come by and they're like, yum, and they just grab it right out with their teeny tiny little pointy noses. And they are the cutest yep. fish in the world. Milton Love does say that they are the second cutest fish, but he's wrong. So, um, oh, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, thrown down, <laughs> throwing down. Uh, the I first, mean, the first cutest fish he says is uh, the Pacific spiny lump sucker, which I will admit is adorable. But <laughs> grunt sculpin, I mean, they make noises. They look like barnacles. Like you, they they look like barnacles, Pat. Like their fins I know. look like they look barnacle appendages. Like uh, what? it's they so look awesome. Like, it's so cool. Yeah, they look like. Uh... <laughs> They're a fish that tries to look like a crab that never skips leg day. Like just thinking about like where where evolution went with that is just like a barnacle is already such a ridiculous concept for an animal, you know, like just cementing your face into a rock. And maybe you have even like a stock and you just use your legs to kick out into the current to gather up food inside your shell. And then there was a fish that was like, hey, can I see those notes? Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Hey, can I, can I, yeah, make sure, make sure you don't copy. So it looks like you, you stole like, oh yeah, yeah, no, I'll change. I'll change some, some of it. <laughs> Be loosely inspired. And then voila, the grunt sculpt and just like, I, I am one of you. Uh, oh, that's awesome. Okay. So that's your favorite at the aquarium. And What's your favorite it, well, in Animal Crossing? Of aquarium? Animal Crossing, it's the coelacanth. And, and I think that that might be a, a very close second for my favorite fish IRL. Just period. Just okay. period. Because they're amazing. Like, you just... Again, I think that as an evolutionary biologist, I just find them, you know... Yeah, you have Beautiful, to. magnificent, just beasts. Um, and the fact that they they were just hanging out in the ocean and no one knew about it for <laughs> so long. And then yep. all of a sudden they were just yeah, like, everyone, oh, that thing's Everyone's so sure that they're extinct. And, yeah. <laughs> and in the deep sea, you could just hear, Which, nope. Just like as an introvert, like that that's ultimate life goals right there, Pat. Like <laughs> You want to be known as a, an extinct organism, but secretly exactly. still be around. That's exactly. your life goal. That's the dream. Emily, where did, 
Emily, where do you see yourself in five years? <laughs> Considered extinct. Considered extinct. <laughs> but yet. <laughs> but still amazing. <laughs> like. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Um, that's great. Okay, so then uh, Animal Crossing is uh, Coelacanth. Aquarium is yeah. Grunt Sculpin. Yeah. What about all time? Cannot be beat. Um, do we know enough to talk about tree lobsters? <laughs> are, 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 I don't know. Are these, are you, are we talking about coconut crab relatives? I'm not familiar with tree lobsters. Tree lobsters. Um, oh, I'm hey, familiar. Sonia over on uh, YouTube says she loves lump suckers. I mean, um, spiny amazing. lump suckers. Y'all open up a second second tab and type in spiny lump sucker. Prepare for the cute. Oh, yeah, Desiree. The history of the U.S. and the French stealing coelacanth specimens back and forth with each other is hilarious. <laughs> I don't remember the story well enough to tell it um, accurately. I'll, I'll paraphrase, but my French ichthyology professor, Giacomo Bernardi over at UC Santa Cruz, was involved with the negotiations between American and French ichthyologists during this blood war over coelacanths. He helped like bridge communications between um, France and, and the US when different coelacanths were discovered. And at some point, I guess the French, I think it was the French biologists like stole number 100, yeah, the, the 100th specimen from some Americans biologists. And when they were over international waters, they uh, dissected it on the plane and discovered that um, there were babies inside this female coelacanth and that they give birth to live young. And so they were the ones who got to describe the reproductive method of the coelacanth through stolen, um, through stolen, uh, uh, yeah, through the stolen <laughs> coelacanth. And I guess Giacomo <laughs> was part of those negotiations between them. And the French biologist said, well, we are avenging number 100. So it was something related to that yeah desiree if you want to type out something in the chat there to explain you have the fresher uh the fresher story there um but yeah if you ever hear if you ever bring up coelacanths around french and american ichthyologists apparently things can get heated <laughs> <laughs> um awesome. pat, pat i do need yeah. to call out this fantastic uh joke that was made over in the twitch chat uh, by tino's okay. Uh, when we are questioning what uh, what tree lobsters were, tree lobsters, one more than two lobsters, <laughs> which just. Uh, I'd like to try that person for treason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was very good. Um, but I, I did. I did with a quick... the with the redeemed highlight i missed the coelacanth stop telling everyone i'm extinct <laughs> <laughs> i i do enjoy the the uh first article that comes up when you google tree lobster which is huge tree lobster not extinct after all <laughs> what so, <laughs> um uh, i love <laughs> that's incredible <laughs> People, oh i guess it's not extinct after all there um Apparently, they Tree are a kind of a uh, stick insect, a very large stick insect uh, that is oh. bright red, hence the lobster mm -hmm. part, um, and that people thought were extinct, and it is not. Um, <laughs> just a lot of yeah. animals, I guess, we're, we were just wrong about. <laughs> just, yeah, like poor, poor intro vertebrates out there that don't want to be seen. Um, <laughs> Oh, and uh, just super quick, uh, just a bibrel over there on the chat. We're not going to talk about boobies, um, blue-footed boobies or red-footed boobies or anything like that on this particular stream because we don't have them in the game. If you'd like yeah. to learn more about those, uh, we can do a, an aviary stream at some point uh, with some of our aviculturists or something. But um, yeah, let's keep it to the Animal Crossing games and the topic at hand. That'll help us out with with the chat moderation. Appreciate it. Um yeah, just all these, <laughs> Emily, all these intro vertebrates that are just like, I just don't want to be seen. And then people don't. forget about them. <laughs> and then it's just like, hey, did you hear? They think you're extinct. Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, what? I mean, <laughs> I wanted to be left alone, I but mean... not left alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great news. <laughs> okay, Finally. here, Desiree. <laughs> Desiree has the story over uh, 
Desiree has the story about the coelacanth. Okay, originally the number 100 was from a specimen that the French accidentally sold to the United States. And the U.S. got to publish first about the species, even though it was found by a French team. But they were always gutted during transport, so they never knew their reproductive strategy. Then the U.S. found one, and the French stole it, and then they they dissected it over international waters and discovered how they reproduce. <laughs> oh, goodness. That, that's so great. I love that story so, so much. Good. It's so, so good. good. Uh, when did the whole coelacanth drama go down? Oh, man, Desiree. 70s? 80s? Maybe in the 80s? Yeah. Oh, hey, uh, Emily, there's a question. Um, did, did we, I don't know if we answered your favorite fish in the whole world yet. Well, it depends on if you are including extinct species <laughs> or, or not. Because, I mean, I, and because it's like an in-betweeny fish. Mm -hmm. I mean, tectolic, obviously, is... A deer or a whale. A deer or a whale. Um, will always have my heart um, as my favorite fish fossil. Um, but in in the real world, I mean, I, I really love grunt sculpins. They might be my I, hands no, down favorite fish. That's but fine. I mean, you can't um, go wrong with coelacanths and you can't go wrong with molas. Like, if you had asked me this question in college, I would have said mola. Um, I did whole presentations on them for the classes that I taught, like <laughs> molas all the way. Um, but then I moved out here to California and I learned about grunt sculpins. So, I mean, uh, yeah. That's awesome. Uh,. Yeah, so there's a few questions over here. Emily, there's a question. Uh, whichever one you feel like doing, do you feel like describing the barrel eye friend that we have behind you? Or do you feel like discussing uh, what it would take to actually have this type of aquarium uh, in the real world? Um, as far as like what, what it takes to exhibit the animals. What do you, which one do you feel like taking there? We Good talk, questions over there. Talk a little and bit that is a Nautilus and a Vampire Squid, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I was just asking, which one do you feel like starting with? Do you want to do Barrel Eye? Let's talk about Barrel Eyes first. Yeah, tell us about the Barrel Eye. Um, the Barrel Eye is a fantastic teeny tiny little uh, deep sea fish that has a clear dome for a head and two tubular eyes that can rotate. And uh, it looks up through that uh, clear gelatinous -y dome through its head uh, to see what's Can we zoom in it. on it? We can. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that right now. Let's Enhance. Zoom. Oh. All right. Swim back down here, friend. All right. Well, we're going to see if it'll, if it'll come into frame here a little bit better for it'll us. It'll come back a little bit. Yeah. And um... And when you said teeny tiny, that's correct. It's just a few inches long, everybody. So if mm -hmm. you've seen those videos of barrel eye, it is a tiny fish. It is not very large at all. Yeah. And as you saw it swing by the screen right there, so you can see those those two green things inside of it, that dome on its head. Those are its eyes. Um, the two kind of blackish spots on the front of its face, those are its nares, its, its nose right there. So when you're looking at it, you know, your brain automatically wants to think like, oh, those things facing forward, like those are its eyes because that's what we, like, that's what we just think of. You know, eyes are pointing forward, but in fact, it's those two green things looking straight up there. Um, and it's looking for things mm -hmm. just hanging out above it in the water column. It's looking for shadows uh, that might be cast by things in the deep sea swimming above it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's such a cool fish, Pat. It's so super cool. And um, filmed by our colleagues at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, yeah. aka Mbari. Um, so if you are looking at barrel eye video footage, a lot of that is going to be coming from um, yeah. from our colleagues. And uh, the cool thing that I learned, uh, you know, many years into knowing about the barrel eye fish, but then talking to some of the scientists is that that clear dome that covers the eyes is also thought to be a shield to help protect them from jelly stings because barrel eyes are uh, ha are thought to steal um, bits of food that siphonophores have caught. So we were talking about siphonophores earlier. Nanomia bijuga is the most common siphonophore that we have in the Monterey Bay. 
Um, and those actually were all around just the other day. And Beryl and I are thought to go up to those and go nab little shrimps and fishes yeah. that the that the siphonophore has already caught. So you're looking at um, you're looking at a little parasite fish in a sense of the siphonophores <laughs> um, uh, with that clear shield over its eyes. And we didn't know yeah. about that shield until we filmed it with ROVs because often it was damaged uh, when they were yeah. collected historically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so back in the day, you know, we knew that it existed, but we had no idea really what it looked like or about that dome uh, because, you know, in the 1800s, early 1900s, people used to just take trawl surveys of the deep sea. So they just drag a net down at the bottom of the, of the ocean and then pull everything up and try and uh, see what they caught. And so we didn't know about, you know, 90% of the gelatinous life that lived in the deep sea because it would just get shredded up and destroyed um, thanks to that net. And of course, anything else that's gelatinous, like that dome on a barrel eyes head, um, would also get shredded up there. Um, mm -hmm. So modern technology has helped us learn a lot about the ecology of the deep sea and how much gelatinous life really is down there and in the ocean in general. Um, there's a question about if it has forward facing eyes and those, those green eyes that it has, um, they, they can rotate. So it's looking up most of the time, uh, but they can, they can rotate them. So as it looks up and looking for that food above it, uh, in those siphonophores, uh, it'll spot it and then it'll swim and it can rotate those eyes to follow where that food is. So it can kind of bring them yeah. forward there. So super cool. Yeah. And there's discussion over in the chat there about Greenland sharks and how long they live and how cool that is. Uh, um, and, uh, yeah, my understanding. So I also, you know, once heard that we didn't really know how it is that these animals caught anything, uh, because they've been found with polar bear parts and elk parts in them, but they swim extremely slowly. Um, but it turns out as far as I know that Greenland sharks are, uh, considered to be scavenger sharks now. Um, so there's some of the sharks that swim around on the bottom going after stuff that has uh, sunk down. And as we know, uh, polar bears can swim, but an old polar bear that dies on the ice uh, is going to eventually melt out and then fall into the water and sink. And then that's where the Greenland shark is getting its polar bears. So um, if you were thinking about a, a massive drama of a Greenland shark, you know, grabbing a polar bear from a, from a seal porthole, uh, that seems more and more unlikely. It seems more likely that they are down there scavenging and eating all of the stuff that is sinking down there. Um, and... Uh, yeah, exactly, Desiree. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, just a polar bear jaw in the stomach. Yeah, so they'll they'll eat uh, a whole bunch of stuff as scavengers down there. And for those of you who are not familiar, Greenland sharks uh, are considered to be some of the oldest vertebrates uh, in the world. Based off of some uh, science, they could be over 400 years old, living in incredibly cold uh, environments in the in uh, the deeper waters up in the up in the Arctic. So yeah. 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 Very, very cool. Um, um we, we Yeah, exactly. Have... Wilderness gate barrel eye rotates eyes forward. Attack, Attack mode. mode. Do a barrel eye roll. <laughs> no. No. Um and Pat, there was also it is a named question. Peppy. Sorry. Our barrel eye's name is Peppy. Yes. Yeah, that was a question. To establish was... the lore. <laughs> Thank you. Uh I saw that question and then I forgot about that question. Thank you, Pat. Um Another question that we did get uh, was about some of the enrichments that we give to our animals at the aquarium yeah. and if we ever give them different kinds of food. Um, you know, oftentimes you'll see it like zoos, uh, you know, they'll give like elephants, giant pumpkins and, and stuff to uh, play with and to eat. And oh my goodness, my voice is doing a weird thing right now. <clears throat> there we go. Sorry, friends. Well, was it, um, what, what was going on? Uh, there was frog? a there was a frog. a frog in the throat. Yeah, a little froggy, <laughs> little froggy <laughs> hanging out back there. Um, but uh, when it comes to enrichments with our with our animals, we typically don't do it so much with the types of food that we give to them. Um, but we will change yes. up their environment and give them different tactile things to interact with. Um, you're, there's a mention of, um, like laser pointers and penguins and penguins chasing them, uh, like a cat, uh, chases laser pointers. I don't know if we've ever tried laser pointers with them, but we do have like a disco ball that we'll put inside of the seabirds exhibit <laughs> that they really like. Um, we also have, um, I know that a, a few of our penguins, not all of them, but a few of our penguins absolutely love, 
our prox cards, our, our little identification cards <laughs> that we use around the aquarium. And if you walk past their exhibit and they're swimming in the water, they'll chase you around the exhibit. Um, so there's definitely um, uh, different things that we'll give to them that way. Um, you know, we always are trying to come up with new and creative uh, ways to enrich the, the sea otters. And so they're always getting weird contraptions that will build our um, latest obsession, I know, is uh, one of our aquarists, Courtney, has been making these amazing ball pits <laughs> for the sea otters. <laughs> uh, but right. the balls aren't plastic balls. They're made out of ice. And some of them will just be plain with ice. Some of them will be um, clam juice ice balls. And then some of them will actually have shrimp instead of the ice balls. And so it takes forever for our team to, you know, freeze all of the molds to, to get enough to fill up a giant kiddie pool uh, for the sea otters. And the sea otters go through it in just like a couple of minutes. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's um, it's one of our favorite enrichments to, to give to the sea otters and to watch the sea otters interact with. But they get all all different kinds of, uh, of things. Um, I do know, since, since we mentioned pumpkins, um, uh, that we have... Uh, put food inside of a pumpkin and given it to one of our octopus before uh, ah. the octopus could care less about the pumpkin and mm -hmm. ate all of the food inside of it and then just crawled back well, right to its preferred corner. you know that it, <laughs> if an octopus was into eating the pumpkin that it would be out of its gourd you know? <laughs> gourd uh, job there pat on that pun no i know Emily. Gourd, thank you thank you yeah gourd, gourd job uh, you're just letting the gourd mm -hmm. times roll you know uh, we are just like <laughs> gourd times roll we're in gourd company, you know, when we got pumpkin puns, you know. Uh, I would say that, you know, uh, next, <laughs> we should pass these puns on to our, to our next of pumpkin. <laughs> oh, um, well, it is like... Uh, wilderness. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> no, I was going to say it's like Arnold Schwarzenegger said, pumpkin it up. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a very big pumpkin. You have to pick those up with two Hans. <laughs> Maybe grab some of your fronds <laughs> so that you can pumpkin you up. <laughs> oh, that is a deep cut. We are old, Emily. I don't know. If, I don't know I if don't anyone know if out there knows. Kids Does anybody out there know about. who Hans and Franz were here to pump you up? Does anybody <laughs> know over in chat? What's the age? What, what are we looking at? Um. Uh, okay, <laughs> so one of the questions that we, uh, we're we going to answer real quick is uh, how to take care of deep sea animals in a pressurized or non-pressurized yes. environment. How do you have one of these tanks here uh, for these deep sea animals? It's a very, very good question. Currently, the aquarium is working on Into the Deep, a new 2022 special exhibition that is going to be all about deep sea life, working with our colleagues at Ambari and deep sea biologists all around the world. And what's really exciting about uh, all of this work that we're getting done now is we're, we're making a few breakthroughs. We're working on a few things. There were a lot of questions that we had about giant isopods. And uh, both Emily and I have touched giant yeah. isopods uh, at the aquarium right. that we're working on exhibiting and bringing to people. But so the main consideration for a lot of these animals here in front of us for display in a public aquarium, not saying that all of these ever could, but if you, you know, had a thought about, OK, vampire squid, we've had those at the aquarium. We have Nautilus at the aquarium. The main thing we want to be thinking about is that many of these animals don't have swim bladders or air pockets in the same way that, oh, of course, there's our, our giant isopod right there. Yes. And our sea... Uh, oh, our look at it reaching up to you. No, hello. Hi, hello. Hi, hi. Hi. How are you? Hello. Um, but so uh, what we're looking at right here with this exhibit, um, most of these animals don't have air pockets. They don't have the same issues. Uh, that other fishes might have bringing them up to the surface quickly, like a uh, deep sea rockfish, for example. The deep sea rockfish that we have on exhibit at the aquarium, we put them into a repressurization container so that we can uh, push them back down to a proper pressure and bring them back up to the surface very slowly. Um, but, you know, a lot of these animals, they, they don't really care too much about the pressure at a certain point. Um, very far down, pressure can help fold proteins and therefore affect how enzymes work and other things in your body. So, um, pressurization might be really critical for reproduction for a lot of these animals and things like that. But um, for living, a lot of these animals make huge migrations, not an isopod like this one, but um, some of these animals make big migrations throughout the day and night changing pressure 
uh, substantially. So um, the main thing that these animals are really concerned about is uh, temperature, gas content, and light. So you want really cold water. You also want water that is very low in oxygen because oxygen can be very toxic uh, to some of these some of these animals. And then you want low light. Light can also be very damaging to these animals. So what we have at the aquarium are really sophisticated systems that are scrubbing oxygen out of water, making um, making it more comfortable for a lot of these deep sea animals. And then also we have chillers that are keeping that water cold to help keep them comfortable as well. So temperature, light, and um, gas content are really some of the main features that we're really uh, working on there. So um, yes, Dail vertical migration over there in the chat is the name for when animals are going up and down throughout the day. Uh, so yeah, so that's one of the big things that we're that we're uh, that we're focused on in terms of how we exhibit these animals uh, and the pressure less of an important part for many of them. Voila. Very fun. Um, what about feeding? Do we mimic sea snow, marine snow? Oh, we probably won't need to do that. We'll just use uh, yeah. krill shakes and other other things. Um, you know, they're eating what's available to them, but we also have other options uh, for delivery as needed. Um, yeah. Good stuff. Um, yeah, over on uh, YouTube chat, yes, we did have a uh, white shark in our open sea exhibit. We've had uh, we had six young great whites from 2004 until 2011, and that was actually the first year that I started at the aquarium was in 2011. Um, with uh, my first week was actually with the young white shark that we had there. So um, those were part of our uh, part of our juvenile research program to try to figure out the metabolism of these sharks, how much energy they need to grow. And so that was really important baseline work so that now we what we are no longer doing is exhibiting uh, young great whites uh, because we got the information that we needed um, and uh, it's better to leave them out there in the wild and we're studying them to figure out where they're going, what they're up to. And so there's lots of research going on around sharks nowadays mm -hmm. uh, out along the bay from that work that we did. But it ended in 2011. That was the last time. There we go. Um, Pat, I know that you'll yep. want to answer this question. Fish the bard over in Twitch chat. Do oarfish Ooh. float in place like that in real life? Yes, they do. It's the coolest thing. So <laughs> see that dorsal fin, how it's undulating up and down like that? These are some of the few fish that can swim vertically. Uh, up and down, um, just they, they can orient themselves vertically in the water and they swim up, they swim down like an elevator. Uh, very few fish are doing that out there. So ribbon fish and oar fish have an incredible body um, shape and form. They're basically like a knife blade. I mean, we're looking at it from the side. You can actually see the fish. But if you were looking straight at its belly or straight at its back, it would kind of disappear into that two-dimensional plane. That was kind of what it was like seeing the ribbon fish in the wild. Uh, it would turn on the side, and then suddenly it's like, oh, cool, we got a fish. And then it turns sideways, and you just have a silvery line that's actually really hard to make out. Um, they also have iridescent sides to them. And so what that means is when you have an exhibit light like this, um when you have an exhibit light like this then they're very shiny and brightly colored but if you don't have if you if you just have ambient light around you um then those fish actually kind of melt into the background of color they're very hard to see um <clears throat> from the scales that they have there on the on the side so mm -hmm. um yeah super super cool animals that are able to swim vertically in the water column that's why they think that they have those really ornate uh, fins there, the fin rays on the top and on their belly, their pelvic fins, those might be ways of making them look more like a stinging jelly when they're younger to hide um, or as lures or to disguise their shape even more so. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, over on YouTube chat, we don't need to be discussing other content creators in detail. Um, uh, and then there was a question from uh, Pug Overlord there about uh, great whites. 
Um, the question is if they uh, are comfortable in a zoo or aquarium, do they get depressed in um, in a in, in captivity? And so that's something that we that we were learning with these young great whites is we were exhibiting the young ones specifically because they were small enough to be able to be comfortable at the aquarium long enough for us to do a few feedings with them and see how fast they're growing. Our first young great white that we had at the aquarium was there for just about 200 days and uh, grew about 100 pounds while it was with yeah. us. So it was doing very, yeah. very well. What ends up happening is that they outgrow the space very quickly. They're incredibly migratory species. Um, they will go from being born off of Mexico to swimming all the way up to the Farallon Islands. And then eventually they will head out to Hawaii and the White Shark Cafe, which is halfway between Hawaii and California. And so these are animals that are not you know, they, they don't take to being in a confined space for a long period of time, which is why we had those young ones always with the plan to release them back out to the wild. And that's why you don't see adult great whites uh, in an aquarium setting. Um, they are so incredibly migratory, uh, moving around so much that uh, having them in that in that smaller space doesn't work out. So mm -hmm. um, and that was all research that we helped help provide there, too. Yeah. What else? Um, Fiore sent us a really cute thing on Twitter. With the, Did you see it already? Yeah, with the buffle head duck. <laughs> we were talking about sharks. So if you heard a weird squeak while you were talking about sharks, that was just me going. Let me see. <gasps> oh, <laughs> little duck. Oh, look at it. Oh, who's your buffle head? I went down into <laughs> it. Um, Emily, did you see who... Hmm. Who was it that sent? Somebody sent fan art of uh, of us with a mola as reindeer. I think Wait, I lost what? track. I'm so sorry. Somebody <gasps> sent us pretty amazing fan art. If you did, um, I don't. If was it in our messages? I believe maybe we were tagged in it, or maybe I was tagged. Oh, no in it i'll see if i can find it here real quick okay uh i'm, I'm scrolling through twitter here working. yeah um going through our notifications this is fascinating content i'm sure <laughs> i'm sure yeah watch uh, as the watch as a social media team goes to <laughs> goes to its feeds <laughs> to find one notification goodness gracious people tweet at us a lot um, your boy Splendens, what about freshwater fish, native fish? Have you ever thought about having one in the aquarium? We do have a freshwater exhibit. We have one freshwater exhibit <laughs> in, in the we whole do. aquarium. We do. Um, but yeah, we have a couple of our local native freshwater species. Um, we've got rainbow trout over there. Um, and then we've got a couple of... Uh, sucker species i know in the outdoor pond i'm trying to think i know that we have another sacramento suckers yeah the sacramento sucker is out there um and pardon me because i'm forgetting <laughs> the other one that we have outside uh but yeah that's where our western pond turtles live yes um which are uh, an endangered species as well so uh, we've got western pond turtles hanging out in that that same spot there um yeah those trout are enthusiastic eaters i will say um so pat and i back in the day when we led tours at the aquarium we would do the feed the fish tour and the feeding frenzy tour um and you would go and you would feed uh the rainbow trouts and you'd have to toss food over this big mm -hmm. uh this big acrylic wall and, and in there, and they all know exactly what time it is. Um, when, when you walk up with the little tray of food that you have, and they'll all come like right up to the window, right up to the surface. And they're just like, yeah, we ready. Like it's snack time. Um, and you would toss food in there and you just have to be very quick about it. You have to very, have very good reflexes because you just kind of like toss the food in there and you have to kind of step back very quickly. Um, because they will, splash all of the water <laughs> outside of that exhibit <laughs> and then you just get a second shower for the day and just get soaked if you stay too close to the window right there or if you toss the food in too close to the the edge of the window sometimes 
uh, one will get so excited that it just like will jump out of the exhibit and you have to get very good at catching uh, fish. We do not have flying fish at the aquarium, but we do have flying fish at the aquarium. Um, so there are definitely uh, fun fish to, to interact with. Um, well, I'm just so sorry to the person who uh, drew that amazing uh, drawing. I can't seem to find what platform it was sent to. If you're watching this, I'm sorry. Send it again, <laughs> please. Um, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> if you are uh, also wondering, do we have bugs intentionally? Intentionally. <laughs> we do have uh, one intentional bug that I can think of at the aquarium, Pat, right? What was that? We have one intentional bug, right? Yeah, well, uh, it depends on your definition of bugs. We certainly have tarantulas. Oh, that's um, true. Oh, I forgot. We I forget about had because Viva Baja will not be there when we reopen. Yeah, we had tarantulas. We had scorpions. Um, uh huh. But the one intentional bug that I was thinking of were our uh, our diving beetles. Yes, 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 yes. Also yeah. in Viva Baja. Also yep. in Viva Baja, so they won't be there anymore. I'm trying to think if we have any other intentional bugs. Yeah. No, um, you know, certainly in this particular setting with blathers being around, he would rather there be no bugs at all. It's even true. He's getting his way. Bugs, yeah. You know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, let's see. What else? Um, there were a few other questions there were in some chat. some questions oh. about um, how often do we collaborate with other aquariums? Um, if we want nah, not a fan that. <laughs> all the time <laughs> every day <laughs> yeah there's actually a huge relationship between the association of zoos and aquariums uh, or aza organizations and we work very closely with a lot of them to uh, propagate corals sharing uh, different animals that one uh, group might be culturing over another jellies um, seahorses uh, cephalopods you name it um if someone out there is is culturing those then we're probably sharing between those different organi organizations uh knowledge science um yeah lots of different things there mm -hmm. shout out to everybody out there doing all that work yeah even pat and i we collaborate with uh, some of the social media teams we do aquariums shout out to our friends over at san diego zoo and oregon zoo um we we bother them a lot so we do, we do. Uh, uh yeah i mean it takes it takes a lot of work a lot of minds to keep these things going so yeah. you know for example our jelly aquarists work very very closely with yes. a lot of colleagues over in japan um because uh japan has more aquariums per capita than anywhere else and so uh, there's a lot of work being done on lots of different types of animals over there, especially gelatinous mm -hmm. organisms. And we work closely with partners over there to make sure that things are looking good. So, um, you know, all around the world, across the United States, you know, uh, Long Beach Aquarium, Georgia Aquarium, Tennessee, um, National. I just started naming all of them. So now I can't stop until I'm sorry, everybody, if I miss out the Shed Aquarium. <laughs> you know, we work with a lot of different a um, lot. orgs, yeah. all of them pretty much in the AZA. Yep. So. Yep. If there mm -hmm. are southern sea otters at an aquarium, they uh, likely came through our rescue program as animals that were deemed non-releasable to the wild. That they wouldn't be able to survive on their own in the wild. Uh, we only have limited space at our aquarium, so we work really closely with our uh, colleagues in the associated zoos and aquariums mm -hmm. to make sure that they are given good homes. Um, most jellies that you see, uh, especially moon jellies, um, at other aquariums outside of Monterey uh, were probably grown by our jelly team. Um, when a you lot hear, of them, yeah. Yeah, when you hear the phrase like aquarium trade, um, that's really what it is, is um, because we're not allowed to sell animals to other zoos mm -hmm. and aquariums or to anyone. Um, it's all it's all via trade <laughs> with people. So people will say like, "Hey, we need more moon jellies for this exhibit." We'll say, "Oh, great! Like we need another bat ray. Do you have a permit to collect one?" Yeah, we do. Great. <laughs> so they'll collect a bat ray and we'll uh, send down moon jellies. And yeah, it's it's all very collaborative. Um, whether it's uh, for exhibits or for research or for rescuing, yeah. Uh, the Association of Susan Aquariums does a great job making sure that um, things are are kept really um, yeah 
Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, as a good example, our collaboration with penguins, um, the species survival plan is a really prominent thing that we um, do to help uh, help the wild population, also different zoos and aquariums, the species survival plan of the reproduction with our penguins um, yeah, and the yeah, sort of yeah. online yeah. dating service for penguins is another great example of how they collaborate. Yep. Um, species survival plans in general. Yeah. Yep. There are a lot of them for uh, AZA institutions. Uh, species survival plans and, um, of course, the SAFE program through AZA. Uh, that's S-A-F-E, Saving Animals from Extinction. Um, is all very collaborative to make sure that we're doing our part. Protecting all these animals. You know, we love them, so. Absolutely. Um... All right. So <laughs> people are very I don't really, uh for yeah. very excited about uh uh online dating for penguins now. <laughs> um I think just looking at chat here. I don't yeah. see any other questions over on YouTube for us to get to. Okay. Uh so uh, we maybe... did have a question over on Twitch chat, Pat. If we want to go yep. over to the moon jelly uh, space Let's do it. and talk about how how jellies are made. Let's do it. I think I'm running the right way. Uh, scary yeah. Uncle Devin over there on uh, Twitch chat. What's replacing Baja? Our new deep sea exhibit coming in 2022. So it's still about a year out. Um, into the deep. But into the deep. Yay. This, by the way, as we've talked about previously, is a nightmare yeah. of aquarium design <laughs> to have an exhibit <laughs> on the ground. People scrape these exhibits so fast that that's why you don't see more stepping on the ground uh, exhibits there. It's very true. Um, yeah. Also trying to get in there to like feed them. Like, do you take the whole lid off? Do you have like an in injection port on the side? <laughs> just, yeah, exactly. Yeah. How do you this doesn't make a whole clean? lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Come on, Blathers. Yeah. yeah <laughs> anybody, together, anybody man. looking at this, anybody looking at this aquarium uh, who's in the aquarium trade is just shuddering at the idea that anyone would design <laughs> this. Um, uh, so moon jelly reproduction. Moon jelly reproduction. I'm gonna have to sorry. I'm gonna have to ask Henry and Bibrel to uh, to uh, chill on that particular line of inquiry. Uh, <laughs> um, if we can keep it focused on natural history, animals, aquariums, different things yeah. like that, and not uh, relationships between the Animal Crossing characters, we appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. What was the question about moon jelly reproduction? Moon jelly reproduction. How are how are moon jellies made? Um... So when a mommy moon jelly and a daddy moon jelly, no. Um, <laughs> so jellies are, are really uh, kind of unique and cool in the fact that they have both sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. Um, so when you're looking at these moon jellies, you are looking at both male and female moon jellies in here. Um, and unless you uh, can see like eggs hanging out uh, inside of their bell there, you really can't tell the difference between males and females. Um, for a lot of jelly species, they are broadcast spawners. So they will just release eggs and sperm into the water, uh, let those gametes go, and just kind of cross their tentacles that something is going to meet up and make more of them. Uh, but for moon jellies, uh, they actually brood their eggs inside of their bells. Um, so the female moon jellies will take in uh, the sperm, brood their eggs inside of their bells, and then uh, when those eggs hatch, they turn into these little tiny, they look like little fuzzy footballs <laughs> um, <laughs> that basically fall to the sea floor, um, and that is where they turn into a polyp. So they land somewhere. Um, and, and I say the sea floor, uh, they can actually attach themselves to, for moon jellies, pretty much any hard surface. Um, so whether that is a rock, a shell, 
um, a bird's foot they have found polyps on before. Like there are gull feet that have little like jelly polyps growing on them. Uh, but that's where those little fuzzy footballs, those planular larvae, they're called. Um, uh, those little larvae will turn into a polyp. And a polyp looks like a tiny little sea anemone or a single polyp of a coral. Um, that's because jellies are cnidarians, just like corals and sea anemones. So they're all related to each other. Um, so they grow these teeny tiny little polyps um, and they can stay like that for a while until something triggers them. Um, and that trigger will cause them to start dividing themselves up and uh, in a process called strobilation. Uh, strobilation. They, yeah, they divide themselves up into these little tiny, tiny discs, little pancakes, um, that are identical clones of each other from that polyp. Um, it's dividing itself up, and here comes that asexual reproduction part where now you have these little clones of each other popping right off of that polyp there, swimming off, and uh, they look like an umbrella that doesn't have all of the fabric <laughs> on it uh, when they first come off of there, um, but then they will grow, uh, connect those little... Uh, arms, I guess you can call them, uh, and uh, get the bell and then grow their tentacles and then turn into the, the Medusa stage, which is what we're looking at right now. So the, the kind of adult stage of a jelly, that's the Medusa stage, um, named after, of course, in Greek mythology, you have Medusa, uh, the one with the snakes for hair. And so people are looking at jellies and they're like, oh, their tentacles look like snakes on them. So they're Medusas. Hmm. So... Um, so that's where they get that name from. Um, and that's exactly I how thought, scientists sounded like, too, by the way, yeah, back when yeah. they were well, just and then, first describing you know, jellies. Yeah. Sadly, ah, of course, Medusa. The, yeah. Of course, the first scientist who discovered uh, a Medusa um, sadly uh, never said anything about it and was just left left everybody in stony silence. Oh. Um, from, uh, from it. Um, I don't know, man. It's all Greek to me. Well, but they, uh, whatever, you know, whoever discovered, whoever discovered Medusa, they rock, you know? <laughs> I think it was Perseus. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so you're, I mean, entirely right. And strobilation is, is such a fun, fun word where they have their little, uh, little rings basically dividing and stacking themselves up like pancakes yeah. Yeah. Uh, before they pop off. Um, it's really pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Geez, no puns for a bit. And then a tidal wave. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, you know, it's all, it's all about current events and what's happening there in the chat. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, Moon jellies uh, have those polyps that we know about. There are other um, types of medusae known as hydro medusae that uh, are a little bit different. Whoa, there's a white brim. Yeah, around. sorry, I pressed a button. It oh, was a, it was was a like, picture frame that popped up. I thought that was me. No, um, no, it was me making mistakes. <laughs> see? No, it's all good. I can get it uh, real cinematic on us here. Dun, 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 dun. Let's see it. Let's see it. Let's see it. Dun, dun, oh. Dun. Oh, nice. Looks good. Anyway. Um, uh, but so the, um, what was I going to say? Oh, there are polyp stages of hydroids that, uh, uh, or of hydromedusae that are a type of hydroid, uh, that will live on shrimps, uh, <laughs> like deep water shrimps that are hanging out in the water column. You'll find them and they are completely fuzzed out with a uh, hydroid polyps growing on them. And uh, a friend of mine, Joe, was diving and filmed a video of a nudibranch that was trying to attack the, sna the uh, shell on a snail that was covered in hydroid polyps that were embedded on the snail. And apparently they home in on living uh, snails to grow their... <laughs> and I see that we're definitely it's going like... through the strobilation at the rave <laughs> yeah, that, right. uh, yeah. that was being mentioned previously. Um, but the... Uh, but yeah, so there are actually these polyps that will grow on shrimp faces and on snail shells. And in the video that my friend filmed, uh, the nudibranch was trying to eat those polyps. But then the snail, thinking that it was being attacked, 
was slapping the nudibranch in the face with its shell and trying to get away. So it seems like that's a little bit of defense mechanism by the hydroid, by being on top of that snail helps keep them uh, away. Pretty cool. Very cool. Um, oh, how do jellies eat? That's a great question over there on YouTube. So the way that a moon jelly eats is by having a layer of mucus on the top of its bell and it gathers up food in that mucus layer on the top of its bell and then forms little mucus balls, uh, jelly boogers, as it were, that then arrive at the uh, bell edge moved there by little hair currents known as cilia. And then the tentacles and oral arms on the bottom side will help move that up onto the oral arm that will then move that to the mouth in the middle. So uh, moon jellies are gathering up food on the top of their bell and maybe a little bit with the tentacles on the other side. Um, and the oral arms, because the whipping motion of a bell of a jelly swimming, when it pulses, it creates a water current that creates a little eddy that pulls food there into that center part. And then longer jellies or jellies with longer tentacles, excuse me, will use their long tentacles to gather up a meal there. And uh, then still other types of uh, jellies, not a uh, true jelly like this, a um, or a true jellyfish, I'd say a scyphozo, and you see right here, but a comb jelly, which is a different phylum entirely. But comb jellies have tentacles that are sticky to grab food. They also have uh, big mouths that they can use to swallow other things whole. So lots of different ways for uh, gelatinous animals to feed um, on out there. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Um, I don't know what's going on on YouTube chat. <laughs> oh, I looked away for a sec. Oh, no. It's all good. Hey, YouTube chat. <laughs> Everybody chill. Otherwise, we'll have to turn it off next time. Um, all right. What else are we, what else are we wanting to do? Oh, Emily, uh, we've got 10 minutes left. I wanted to go grab snowflakes yes. if we can. Yes. Let's, let's do that. Let's go grab some snowflakes. Because we didn't really explore the winter wonderland. I hope that people don't think that the video is clickbait now. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did spend the whole hour and a half in the aquarium after all. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> uh, on, on the way outside, uh, we did get a question about, um, uh, if jellies are edible um and yeah nah, there, some are. Mm -hmm. there are some species of jellies that you can eat um in particular over uh in like korea and japan um they are a very popular food item um i know that uh some species species of uh blubber jellies are uh, and they uh will oftentimes uh take those jellies and slice the bell um, like so that it makes little rings and uh, dehydrate those and then um, rehydrate them in some kind of sauce and then uh, put it on a salad and it's called rubber band salad um, which doesn't sound super that. appetizing but uh, apparently it's very delicious and I will I will take people's words for it what? I got stuck. You dig it. Go around the tree. Uh, yeah, look at me trying to go around the tree, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you I'm, have to take it slow. I Don't. am taking it slow. <laughs> I am stuck. <laughs> <laughs> I am actually stuck behind your tree. Can you can you ladder your way down? I'm laddering my way down. Well, now you're going to be stuck back there. Keep on going over to the over to the left. I do not like your tricks, Emily. <laughs> These games you play. <laughs> I will keep my <laughs> secrets. Thank you. Um, okay, do you have a net? Uh, do I have a net? My net matches you. Do you have a net? Yay! I have a net. Okay, so uh, let's look for a snowflake that we can catch. Uh, so the snowflakes that we can catch are going to be bigger, and they're going to make noise, and they're going to kind of be floating around. I don't know where you went. Uh, for some reason, towards the airport. <laughs> there you are. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, I see one. Oh, oh, oh! Yep, there's one back there. Don't run at it. And then there you go. Hey. Yay! It's a tiny, beautiful sculpture. You did it. And now you can craft things with it. 
Ta-da. Cool. It doesn't melt when I hold it. How cold are my hands? I need better circulation. <laughs> I mean, you can put them in your basement, too. Like, you can put them in storage and they won't melt. Those are some, like, deeply frozen snowflakes that you've caught there. So, That's good job, awesome. buddy. Um, somebody just said, how do you resist not hitting each other with nets right away? Boink. <laughs> <laughs> I was so perfectly synced up. <laughs> that was great. Oh, that was awesome. Um, so, uh, Mitch D over there on YouTube has a question. Yeah. Uh, especially, let's see. Um, how do sharks and other migratory animals ha handle being in rough seas, especially in the middle of the ocean? Is it calm under? That is an excellent, excellent question. Yeah, and Celestina is answering uh, some of those questions over there already. Um, but uh, yeah, the the um, the the main thing about a lot of that that storm surge that we see on the surface is that the deeper down you go, the less it really bothers uh, the animals at all. There could be a massive storm on the surface and an animal underwater would have no idea. And so it's actually a really interesting thing when you're scuba diving, just Emily randomly just catching a sturgeon. <laughs> I have just, to, this is how I fund our, all of our, just, our, our beautiful island projects here. Just it's, NBD, just catching sturgeons. Through sturgeon. <laughs> just got a caviar know, Emporium. you know that's a sea bass over there. So I that's just, right. yeah. Where did you go, by the way? Uh, she's got I'm a caviar there. Emporium. But so the, um, yeah, so out there, you know, there could be a huge uh, swell, a current, uh, or the currents are really going to be affecting the animals a lot more than the swell. Uh, when it comes to ocean swell, uh, the bigger the waves are, and when you're, like, the deeper you go, it's more of a side-to-side -side motion. So, you know, I've gone diving when there's huge waves, and underwater, in the shallows, you can be moving around quite a lot, but then down deeper, it's almost nothing. Uh, you just kind of are bobbing back and forth, so... Um, what looks like a huge storm to us is really is really not a lot. You know, there's also birds and other organisms. You would think like when there's a huge storm that it's really difficult for them. But some of them like storm petrels and other birds like that really um, favor a storm front to be able to uh, move around. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a completely different world for a lot of those animals. I imagine that those animals look at us and see, you know, humans living at every latitude and longitude of the planet. You know, how do you guys deal with the cold? And it's like, well. Actually, we can, you know, put on our little snow hats and, uh, and other insulation. And how do you deal with the, the humidity or this? And just there's so many different adaptations and ways to deal with uh, what's going on on land. But in the ocean storms, you know, if you're underwater, you're probably not you might not even notice if there's a huge storm going by. Yeah. But of course, if you end up having like a tsunami, an earthquake, a major uh, turbidity current event where there's maybe an underwater landslide or if there's a volcano erupting underwater, um, that could be rather uh, difficult to, to handle as an animal. But, you know, those big storms, if you see big waves, you know, a shark swimming by is just like, oh, little <laughs> little bump today, you know, and we could be surfing 50 foot waves. So, yeah, it's a very. Yeah. All right. Um, Emily, is there anything else that we need to. Is there anything else that we need to mention here before we wrap up the stream? Um, we had a comment over on Twitch, yeah, a couple of them, about coming to the island. Um, so I dropped our dream address code over there in case anyone wants to visit. Um, it ha I have not updated it uh, with our new wintry wonderland, so I will, I will do that in the next couple of days. So if you want to go to the fall version of our island, um, go check out that dream address. Uh, well, 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 you can, and then I'll update it for the winter time because it feels like it's it's time, <laughs> it's time for me to update it for winter. Oh yeah, yeah sorry, yeah. Des Desiree is mentioning yes. Yeah, some sharks, other species will clear out from areas when there's huge hurricanes. Some storms can completely mess up the reefs. Yeah, in shallow water, definitely there can be some migration of animals away. Huge surf, you know, hitting. If you've heard of. Uh, of um you know the wave called chopu over i believe that's in it's in uh, polynesia uh around fiji um there when there's massive massive storms those waves break on top of the reef can break up the coral can really destroy an environment um so yeah definitely if you're in the shallows it's going to be really big deal and so that's why animals move offshore uh into deeper water 
um, to, to handle it. Yep. Very good. Thank you for the extra info. Sorry, Emily, you were you were wrapping us up. Oh, uh, I sure. Believe. I didn't, yeah, or sure. maybe you were. I don't know. I'm sorry. I, I forgot where we were at. I was reading. <laughs> no, the chat. we're just answering uh, some last questions there in the chat. Um, but yeah, I can wrap us up here. Maybe. Oh, all right. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a question in chat. Can you bring noise canceling headphones to the aquarium? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. When yeah. we're open up again. Yep. Um, um, and also, if when... you come in the later afternoons, especially in the midweek, that like starting around three o'clock, stuff really starts to slow down historically at the aquarium. Um, obviously, we don't quite know what that'll be like going forward uh, with visitation for a little while yet with uh, the coronavirus. But um, there are definitely places and times of day where you can escape yeah. uh, larger crowds there. But yeah, uh, absolutely. Canceled, right? um, we also have we now have. Um sensory bags too so uh folks who might have yes autism or have uh, loved ones who have autism um where a lot of you know when you're at the aquarium can kind of be a lot of sensory overload there um we do have bags that um that help with that including like earplugs noise canceling headphones things like that um as well as tactile things um that you can inter interact with uh while you're visiting the aquarium too um so uh, those will be available when when we're open again too. So we definitely want to make sure that everyone who wants to come to the aquarium is able to come to the aquarium in a way that feels safe and comfortable for them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and um, just a, a few more questions here. Uh, looks like Boppy Mitchell. Uh, yes, we do have volunteer opportunities, uh, especially in the future. Um, uh, the aquarium would not function without its volunteers uh, when we're open. 1,500 volunteers we have at the aquarium, so definitely volunteer opportunities. So go to our website to look at that if you wanted to. Um, and then another question here. Uh, have we discussed sea butterflies before on the stream? Yep, that's where my name, Terrible Boy, comes from, <laughs> from the uh, pteropod. We actually talked about them at the beginning of this stream here, Ever Knitter. So once uh, the VOD is up there, head over to the start and do discuss sea butterflies a little bit there. Um, yeah, very good. Well, we did a little bit of win. Oh, oh Avi, thank thanks for the gift subs. Incredible. Um, oh, El Michelle Lovato was you who answered the question uh, about the snowy plover on Instagram. That would either be Emily or Rachel that answered your question. It was probably both of us because i think that uh rachel got the question and then i helped with the answer of that question but yes well there you go michelle it was there a tag team effort Ooh. yes yes Emily uh, and shout rachel. out to rachel for being on top of uh, a lot of that social care for us that's right and answering a lot of questions she she the best but pat it's yeah. six o'clock it's it six is. It's December well, it's five o'clock here too. We're time oh, traveling. Sorry. Yeah, it's five o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> where you are, it's six o'clock where I am. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, That's so wild. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> How does time? <laughs> time is meaningless. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I love your snow plow. Oh, that's a great little acronym. <laughs> 8 p.m. Oh. over there. <gasps> 8 people are in other time zones. I know. Hi, West, Hi, West Coast. Hello, East Coast. Hello, West Coast. Hello, East Coast. Hello, all of you fellow mountain timers with me right yeah. now and everyone in between. Um. Indeed. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we're, we wrapped it up. Thank you so much, everybody, for <laughs> such an amazing year, uh, for being with us here through the quarantine. Uh, we've been closed now for you know over 10 months so we really appreciate all of your support and for being there as an audience for some educational gaming content uh, while the aquarium is uh still has its door closed so really really appreciate all of you being there thank you for all of your questions um and i hope you have an amazing uh new year obviously uh the difference between 2020 and 2021 is just a matter of changing a changing a number so i hope that everybody is still staying safe out there uh and we're looking forward to to that new year but yeah just really on this last wednesday of 2020 uh just thank you so much everybody who's been a part of these live streams for supporting us being part of the lore asking us great questions we can answer about what's going on uh in the natural world and yeah 
It's just been a whole lot of fun. And thank you, Emily, as always, for setting up the tech. It would not be possible without Emily. If we could get some Ws in the chats, please. It went um, so much better today, Pat. Yes, also, everybody. Um, we need to share those Ws because um, in case you haven't checked out over on our YouTube channel today, Pat made a brand new Curl Waves radio. That's right. There's um, new Curl Waves. Which is amazing and awesome. And I'm obsessed with like the first two songs on it already. So um <laughs> Just huge shout out to Pat and all of your work on those because oh, thank they're you. wonderful. Um, yeah. They've helped a lot of people during this very stressful time. So, yep. I'd uh, also like to thank, uh, if we're just, th um. yeah, if I we're throwing thanks, <laughs> I'd like to thank our, our mods, uh, yes. um, for, for helping us out. Editor Deb, Celestina Kitty, uh, and Sarah, um, Senior, Sarah uh, and also Ali every once in a while. Ali is in the chat there too. Thank you for helping us out. Um, yes. And uh, all of the mods yeah. love. Yes. All the mods. Was, was for the mods. Was to the mods. <laughs> was to the mods. Um, yeah, we yeah. would not have been able to survive and <laughs> operate with without our mods and without help from uh, a lot of friends who have reached out to us while we have been and navigating the the seas of, of live streaming on twitch and, and youtube uh with these gaming streams um so just huge shout out to everyone who has who has helped make these possible this year and i'm looking forward to what 2021 holds for our gaming streams more education that's for sure <laughs> uh. <laughs> That's it. That's all I got. Thanks, all everybody. Got. All right, everyone. Well, with that, we're going to wrap I've it up. I've been your terrible boy. <laughs> and I have been M, your very exhausted engineer. It's been a wonderful time with you all here. Um, we'll wrap it up with uh, a, a zoom on our terrible boy holding a patera pod um, <laughs> next to uh, p p tap Patal. I was, I was trying to make it a, a pal, but it just sounds a like I'm saying a, a, a towel. But I, yeah, yeah, that didn't work at all. Oh gosh, that's this, all good. This, this you miss, you miss, shot, you miss shot you don't take. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, a very happy new year, everyone. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next year. Bye. Ooh. Bye.